This second presentation from Anne is, is centered around the model, their, their legal model, their operating model in Park Slope. And of course, our, one of our primary objectives this weekend is to try and flesh out for ourselves the most appropriate urban cooperative model for ourselves in LCG. Our current legal form is company limited by guarantee with no share capital. And we went for that specific, simple form just to get the show on the road. But now with almost 12 months behind us, we have to define an appropriate legal model for ourselves such that when we start our funding campaign, we will know what sort of legal structure we're putting our money into, what, what we're asking the general public to put money into, or what we will be asking the general public to put money into. So with, with that in mind, I'll hand over to Anne for a, a 15 minute session on the Park Slope model, and then we can have all questions and Q&A around that, Anne. okay? Thank you. Yeah, I will be briefer about this because I, I think I would rather hear your questions. Um, and I know that the laws that allow us to be a co-op don't exist here in Ireland. So it would be, it's a little, it's not exactly, it's not a comparable situation here. Um, I just put up our bylaws because um, those are kind of our governing documents in, <coughs> in, United States, uh, each state regulates how businesses are incorporated. Um, so we have in New York State an actual cooperative corporations law. So that means when we went with our articles of incorporation to the state, you file them with the state, the state recognizes us as a legal entity. We're not, you know, there's, corp there's the corporate law, the business law, there's the nonprofit law, and then there's the cooperative. Law. So, it, um, so that is extremely beneficial because the state itself says you can do things differently. You're a cooperative. And the state actually, it's kind of interesting, the state does two, the state did two really kind of um, remarkable things uh, in the law. Let me see if I can find, let me just read you the part that's to me is really kind of interesting. Um, it's, <laughs> so in the very beginning article of the Cooperative Corporations Law in New York State, it's, the, it's written, it is the declared policy of this state as one means of improving the economic welfare of its people, particularly those who are producers, marketers, or consumers of food, to encourage their effective organization in a cooperative associations for the rendering of mutual help and service. So the state is saying the economic welfare of its people is of importance to us and, and that cooperatives as mutual help and service. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it, I can't, I, I guess, you know, in sort of legal terms, it's like, wow, they want us to exist. And, and so that was, I think, that's very supportive. And I know you, there isn't that same opportunity here. Um, but, the other thing that the state has also declared for us, which I think is um, interesting, is, and we actually had a member who many years ago, after we were formed, helped to insert this clause into the Cooperative Corporations Act because he felt so strongly about it. Um, Another clause says, a cooperative corporation shall be classed as a non-profit corporation, since its primary object is not to make profits for itself as such, or to pay dividends on invested capital, but to provide service and means where its members may have the economic advantage of cooperative action, including a reasonable and fair return for their product and service. So we're actually recognized that we're not I mean, it sort of enshrines in law that we're not a profit-making enterprise. It's not the same as being a charity. Um, Non-profit is not a legal tax recognition. We still pay a lot of taxes. We pay, in, we pay income taxes on our proceeds. Um, but it's the fact that, again, it's a recognition that you can have a corporation that is organized for, again, mutual help and benefit to its members and not be in the profit making business. Like that's not the intent and we don't have to set it up in a way that there's the invested capital is returning. 
Um, the New York State law does not mandate uh, your re does not limit the return on capital. When I was talking about in the previous um, presentation about members loaning us money and we came up with a loan structure from one to seven years and the, the interest related to that, um, we, we were not required by the state to cap the amount of interest, but there are states that in their cooperative laws, because of this principle that you're not there to, it's not an interest making thing for someone to invest money in to make a bunch of money out of, they capped at 8%, so you couldn't even, um, if someone loaned you money, pay them more than 8%. We don't have that restriction, but we never had more than 8%. I think the highest might have been ours, might have been 7%. Um, the longest loan, seven years, was a 7% um, return for people. Um, so anyway, what, and, and then the rest of the law basically for us kind of says how directors function, how members function, all those kind of things. So you kind of, they give us a basic framework of like what a, what a quorum would be for an annual meeting, things like that. Um, but it's, it's very high level, broadly defined. It's not detailed. Um, so when in 19, well, I don't know. Okay, this is one thing we did do wrong. Uh, we didn't incorporate until 1977, um, which was not the thing to do, obviously, because everyone who at that point was a member of the co-op was legally liable. And um, I guess it was, again, one of those hippie things. They just didn't really think about that. And then suddenly someone told them, wait a minute, you gotta incorporate. Um, but anyway, so in 1977, we just filed the Articles of Corporation to say, okay, we're gonna be a co-op. And then we actually got to, down to the task of writing bylaws. Now bylaws um, in our cooperative corporations law is required. In some laws, it's not required. They're usually an internal document. We don't file these with the state. The only thing that gets filed is the Articles of Incorporation. These are our bylaws. They're not, um, they're not, they're binding only on us and they, they cannot violate any law, any portion of this law, but within the guidelines of this law, we can do anything we want, basically. Um, so we, got down to the business of writing how we were gonna govern ourselves. And that's basically what bylaws are, is how you're going to govern yourself. Um, because as a cooperative, you obviously have a governance structure that is different than a shareholder structure, um, because you don't have outside investors who, who give money in a share situation, but really have, and, and the, their participation in the corporation is often based on the number of shares they have. In the cooperative corporation's law, it's only one member, one vote. It's explicitly in the law. So if someone, <clears throat> everyone gives in their $100 and then someone says, we have a loan drive, let's say, and someone says, well, I'm gonna give $500 now to the loan, you know. Um, it doesn't buy them any more rights. The law restricts that. So it doesn't matter you give, if every, the, the right comes through your initial equity investment. What you give on top of that to help the business grow as a capital investment is not awarding you any more rights. And so the, the law protects it from having a, you know, someone with deep pockets in your membership saying, well, I gave $50,000 to that loan drive, so I want everyone to do it my way, you know. It, the law says, no, oh, no, no, can't do that. You know, that's irrelevant. You did that voluntarily. It's not a requirement of membership. So you don't get anything else out of it. So I think that's, um, it's important for when you, when you write your bylaws to, to be explicit about what the investment, equity investment is and what it awards anyone and how it can be returned to the member, which is another part of it. Um, so we have, we're, we are called, I think you called yourself a non-shareholder. I mean, we're, we're called a non-stock membership court, um, cooperative in the law, so we don't have stock. There are some, you know, shares, there are some co-ops that still have a share system, but it's very difficult legally to maintain the issuing of shares and the returning of shares, so most don't do it anymore. It's you're just your membership itself is your non-stock sort of certification that you're a member. 
Um, we, uh, then, then we get into, if you want, can you just scroll down? I just, because I don't have, we just get into very, again, we don't get into a lot of detail in the actual bylaws. We define what a member is and how we use these terms, who is an eligible member. We refer to natural persons. So you can't, as another corporation, join the co-op. Um, I don't know. Our Supreme Court might now declare that illegal since they're giving corporations in America rights as persons. <laughs> I don't know. We might. If, it might be a challenge someday. Um, but so this... So we're not joining any other organization. So even um, there are some co-ops that have like a, a mixed multi-stakeholder and producer co-ops are part of the consumer co-op. They kind of, we don't have that provision, uh, that producer co-op. As individuals, those people could join and fulfill the, the requirements, but they, they can't join as a producer co-op. Um, we sort of say we're going to do this in equity investment. We don't say how much. Um, we don't say how much, basically, because once you write it here, you say, oh, it's $100 or it's $50, whatever it is. Um, and then that's not adequate. You have to go through the process of changing your bylaws. So because the law doesn't make us, it makes us say that there is one, but it doesn't make us say how much that is. So that's, it's really important. Um, the, and then it's important to tell people how they get out of it or how the co-op <coughs> thinks they're getting out of it, um, out of their owner equity investment in their ownership. Um, again, you want to just set up a process in which it's clear to people both how they join and how they terminate. And um, we've never had this issue, but I do know of <coughs> startup co-ops that do this. <coughs> well, even, even some established co-ops, um, they actually, do not, they have in their bylaws a provision for paying back the equity investment to the departing member at the discretion of the organization. So they pay it back eventually, but they might pay it back in increments over time, whatever. We're kind of on demand. If you come in on a Wednesday, you fill out the form to leave the co-op, your check will be written on Friday. We, we, we don't say anything. But other startup co-ops have wanted not to drain themselves of equity capital by letting people have it on demand. So that's something you could consider, is like if you're going to ask people for an equity investment and then they're terminating, will you give it on demand when they want to leave or will you structure it so that you can have the discretion to not give it until it's financially possible? The only requirement is, is that if you have any kind of application form, it should state there that the equity investments return, not returned on demand, and they give it the structure so people are aware. You want to just always make people aware so you're not legally caught out and someone's saying, well, you didn't tell me that. You know, I signed this thing, I joined this thing, I'm an owner, and now you're telling me as an owner I can't get my money back until, you know, 90 days from now or six months from now or whenever you feel like it. Or, you know, so that's yeah, important. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, that hundred dollars, that's um, indicative of cooperative membership in grocery store. It's low. It's low. Is it it's our, ours is low. Um, uh, I've seen now, uh, you know, the average startup is asking like two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, a hundred is adequate for us. It wasn't always a hundred. It was, we were on it long ago, we were on an annual $10 thing and then that just got too messy. The annual thing is just too messy because then you have to keep track of who's paid their annual thing and then did they pay it the next year and then what does that mean if they didn't pay it the next year? Are you tracking them down to find out that they just forgot or they want to leave the cup? I mean, it's, it's very messy. Um, it's administratively burdensome. So if you just do it once, and you know, for people who can't afford it up front, the hundred dollars or the hundred euros or whatever it is, then you say, okay, well, give us ten euros a month for ten months, or give us five euros a month for twenty months, you know, whatever it is. Um, but the annual thing can can be administratively, I think, a little cumbersome to do. Um, and I think you should set it. 
No. It should be at the, at the uh, an amount that is reasonable for capital contribution, but not, not, un, not, not questionable. Uh, people are like, oh, well, really? They need 250 euros from me? What are they going to do with the 250 euros? You know what I mean? It's, it, yeah. it, you know, it has to be somewhere where you feel comfortable that if we have projected um, outlays of expenses in the, to get ourselves up and running of whatever, 10,000 euros to outfit the store, buy inventory, get the shelving, get the cashier, get the registers, all that, then it should be a reasonable amount to reach that, maybe not put all the burden on the members to reach the 10,000 euros, maybe put 60% or 75% of the burden on the members and the other will come from a bank loan or something, you know. So you just, you, you all have to think about forward thinking about your projections of what your expenses would be and then kind of work yourself backwards into the investment. It's a really important thing too for us, it's, it's constantly, we give, because some, because about 18% of the, our co-op leaves in any one year, <coughs> so it's a constant rotating, but it's like, it's a constant source of money for you. It's in just general revenues. It's not segregated. I would never segregate these funds. If they're segregated, they appear like they're in a bank account. They're not in a bank account. You know, they're actually equity for the co-op to run. <coughs> so don't segregate them off and say, well, we won't touch them. I found, recently Joe and I found out a couple of co-ops still do that. We can't figure out why. Why would you do that? Why would you collect a half a million dollars from people and say, oh, but we're just going to put it over here and not touch it. It doesn't, it's your, it's how you capitalize yourself. So why would you segregate it? And, you know, I think they're afraid that when it comes time to give it back, they won't have it. So if you put it somewhere, then you'll have it. But you can't think that way from the get-go. You gotta think we'll be successful, we'll be sustainable, we'll have the money, we'll have a positive cash flow so that when someone comes to get their money because they're leaving Limerick or they can't do this anymore, whatever, we'll have the money to give back to them. You know, I think, I, so I think it's more just, you know, have confidence, you're gonna be able to do it. So a uh, hundred, uh, very, in very rough figure, 160 of your cash on hand, 160,000 of that would be your equity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's on our it's on our financial statement, such like that. You know, our auditors require it to be like a line. Yeah. Um, that that is. I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. Um, but in terms of your total, but in term, it's very small. Yeah. It, yeah, but see, you're most of like. Like recently, we closed our financial year with $3 million in cash, right? And people are like, whoa, $3 million. What are we gonna do with the $3 million? It's like, well, $1.8 million is owed to someone called your vendors. We, we collect cash quicker than we have to pay it out. We're usually on 21 day terms with most of our suppliers. So, but we've sold the food that we, the food we're paying for in 21 days, we might've paid the second day we had it inside the building. So we have 19 days of having a very positive cash flow. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, it looks like $3 million, but go down to the liability, see what we owe everybody, it comes down to a lot less than $3 million, you, you know. Um, so, the 160 is significant in the sense that it's not sales driven, it's not owed to anyone, it's, it's, it's working capital. So, you know, and that's, and if you, if we possibly had to raise it, because let's say our overall expenses went up, our, it didn't seem reasonable anymore, it becomes, it, it again, it, it becomes capital in the business that hopefully will be used to increase the business so that your sales do rise. So it seems insignificant in the larger scheme, but when we say we sold $49 million of goods, well, we bought those goods for $41 million. So actually, when you take it, it's $49 million in sales, 41 million went right back out the door to a vendor, or, you know. And so then you have $8 million left to do everything else with. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not a tremendous amount of money in the end. Um, the sales always make it sound like we have more money than we actually do. 